Uh, what I'm going to talk a little bit about is handling and chemical restraints and field anesthesia for this first part uh, because we get a lot of um, questions about that. And I've tried to give you some notes in the uh, proceedings books relative to some aspects of camelid behavior and handling and, and drug use and whatnot. I'll go through some of the highlights of that in here. And I'm going to make you look at some real intense purple slides while we're doing that. So, um, you know, camelid behavior, camelids are a pretty interesting uh, group of animals for us to work with. Um, I think that one of the nice things about having camelids in our veterinary curriculum is that they are the, the ultimate composite creature, you know, because we find aspects of camelids that are identical to horses and identical to cats and identical to ferrets and identical to sheep and identical to goats and identical to cattle. And um, it's, like, it's like the last thing the Lord did was took the best of everything he could find and put it together and made a camelid out of it. And so that's kind of neat. Um, it allows us to really emphasize um, why we teach veterinary medicine the way we teach it, you know, because they are a composite species. And, and uh, you know, I tell when people call up and they say, well, we didn't have any camelids in school, so I've been really nervous about working on them. Um, sure, you had lots about camelids in school. It's just you don't know which part of your cat lectures and your horse lectures and your ruminant lectures to stick together. So that's our role is to stick those things together. And I think you can appreciate that from the presentations that you've already had today. You know, we don't go out with Q-tips on the llamas like you might a cat, but they're induced ovulators, you know. They metabolize lipids a lot like a horse does. They metabolize, you know, um, a lot of things the way digestively, the way ruminants do. It's an interesting mix. And so our job is to try to put that together and make it make sense. And, and hopefully we hit the target more often than we miss it. Um, but we learn something all the time. And so from a behavior standpoint, you know, these are uh, herd animals. You know, they do like to move in groups. Um, a lot of it has to do with the way they're, uh, managed as much as it is from their natural tendencies. And so, you know, when we look at uh, working with alpacas and llamas, we kind of equate alpacas to sheep because they like to bunch together and they like to avoid, you know, capture and things like that. And uh, we equate llamas a little bit closer with goats in terms of that interactive, curious, you know, type of, of uh, behavior pattern and the way they respond to people. But We've seen llamas that very aggressively herd up and avoid human contact, and we've seen alpacas that very aggressively seek out human contact. And it all has to do with the way, uh, how much contact they have and the quality of that contact with the animals. And when we go out uh, to an alpaca once a month and uh, shove a rigid foreign body up their rear end to figure out where they're pregnant, or we grab them and we throw them on the ground, we stretch their legs out and run a hot clipper over their body, to, fear, you know, to clear off the fiber you know, every May, uh, that's not a rewarding experience. That's not a stimulating experience. But we go out and work with them and work around them and feeding and cleaning and preparing for shows and things like that. Um, you know, we have alpacas that will crawl right up in your lap. You know? And so a lot of that behavior has to do with their environment. And so what we try to do is we work with the animal within their comfort zones. You know, that's the big thing for me is that I don't try to force an animal to conform to what I expect it to act like. I try to work within the confines of that animal. And I get calls from people that says, well, we can't do this because we can't keep them standing. My question is, is why, are you keep, why are you trying to keep them standing? You know, um, are your knees that bad? You know, I had, my, my knees aren't great. We did a lot of alpaca uh, fertility work in Ohio. I got a hydraulic lift for it. You know, rather than getting down on the ground 10 times a day, let them lay down, lift them up if that's what you need to do. Work with the animal in their, con in their confinements rather than trying to force them to conform to ours. And uh, you get spit on a lot less. You get kicked a lot less. You have a lot less aggravation. You get the job done a lot faster. And so for me, that's, a, you know, that's something that you know, we have to be prepared to be that flexible. So we try to capture them in a non-threatening manner. And that usually means keeping them in groups. Um, these are very socially hierarchical animals. You know, they have um, a set structure to their groups. And the only thing that you have to do to realize that is go into a group and pull one animal out. And the entire group will reshuffle its social structure, usually. Uh, you take an animal that's out of one group and put it into another group, and the entire social structure 
will readjust itself. And the top animal usually ends up still being the top animal, you know, but the bottom animal sometimes ends up moving up the ladder a little bit. And it's not hard to see that. And so we need to be aware of that and try to work around it. And so what we tend to do is try to capture those animals um, into uh, successively smaller pens. Um, you know, we made a uh, videotape with Marty McGee Bennett a number of years ago. And one of the things that we tried to express in that, in that uh, handling, ta handling tape was working within the behavior social structure of the group. And so we take these animals out of pastures and we put them into smaller arenas and then we'll, set, we'll select out a smaller group to go into a smaller arena yet. Eventually we get the one animal that we want. But by doing that, you know, we're, we don't get them into a defensive mentality. Once you get them into a defensive mentality, it's really hard to break that cycle. And so now you're fighting with them for the entire rest of the procedure. And so we try to avoid that by working within their social groups um, so that we don't have to fight uh, that structure. And so, you know, working or allowing them to move into an area as a, as a group is an you know, important aspect of how we try to adjust that behavior. There we go. That actually was just a videotape of them coming in out of the pasture. Uh, capturing and haltering, there's, you know, there's some things that we like uh, to avoid and some things that we like uh, to do to make the animals feel more comfortable when we're working with them. Um, you know, and so if we're trying to get them out of that area and get our hands on them and, and um, you know, whether that's to put a halter on them or simply to do manual restraint uh, to get them captured so that we could do an ultrasound or draw a blood sample or something like that, um, we try to remember that they have a similar pivot point that we see in the other livestock species, and that's the point of the shoulder. And, uh, and so if we get in front of the, in front of the, port of the point of the shoulder, we're pushing their backup button. And if we're behind the uh, point of that shoulder, we're generally pushing their go forward button. And there, there is a neutral switch in there somewhere. That's hard to find a lot of times in the camellas. It's easier to find in cattle. But, um, we can direct them where we want to go without ever touching them and usually without getting in within more than a few feet of them so that we can maneuver them into an area that we want. You know, and then we usually try to capture the neck first and obtain control of the neck. And once we've got control of the neck, we can pretty much do anything they want, that we want. Um, you know, the most common thing that we do because we're getting them into, into successively smaller pins is simply using our out, outstretched arms to reach around and grab the neck. Um, the animals are not breakable, or I should say they're breakable, but they're not fragile. You know, we can reach out and grab the neck of that animal uh, fairly firmly and not let them toss us around the stall. Uh, but a very simple approach to that is just getting a loose rope. And if you use the pivot point of the animals, so we're moving them into a corner, we throw a rope over their back, and then we walk, and then we distance ourselves from the animal, walk around so that we pivot them around the other direction. Now they're presenting the loose end of that rope that we just threw over their back and we can pick up that rope and, and uh, wrangle their neck in pretty easily. And uh, that's a very non-threatening thing to do. It's not gonna induce a spit response and it's not gonna get them into a defensive posture very much. And then we can go ahead and put that halter on or whatever else it is that we want to do. Um, we, do we do need to keep in mind that these animals are semi albigate nasal breathers and. It's relatively easy to obstruct airflow in the head. Um, one of the things that, that we see go on once in a while when we're doing teaching labs and whatnot is um, we're doing a reproductive ultrasound and so everybody's really focused in on what's going on in the back end, back end of that animal. And then the animal starts to kind of flip out and get a little upset and throw itself around a little bit. And so we figure, well, you know, they're objecting to the procedure so we need to sedate them. No, we just need to readjust the halter so they can breathe because hypoxemia results in uncooperative behavior, you know. And um, that's easy to induce with a halter. And uh, we see that in a lot of the species that we work with. And so the halter of the camelid is intentionally fitted not to be left on the animal. And, um, you know, when we have animals hospitalized in the clinic, uh, that's one of my big things. I go into the stalls and take their halters off, you know. The camelid halter, when it's properly fitted, you know, is firmly applied to the head so that it can't slide down on the nose, which also makes it firm enough so that they can't eat easily. You know, and so to have a halter properly fitted, we don't want it left on the animal because then they're not gonna be comfortable and they're not gonna be eating normally and whatnot. And so even an animal that is fairly aggressive and fairly challenging to work with, um, we still 
don't halter them unless um, unless we've got some very special reason to do that. As you know, lead lines and whatnot. There's a lot of different ways to handle these animals. What we tend to find is is that they cooperate a lot more by distance. Uh, camelids like to feel like they're in the possession of their own space. And what I hear a lot of people refer to, a lot of the behavior trainers and whatnot, refer to it as, as balance. And, uh, and I agree with that concept, uh, but I think the basis of balance is, is being in control of your own space. The animal doesn't want to be in a situation where they feel threatened, they feel somebody's trying to invade their territory, so to speak. And so when we're moving them around, uh, we generally allow space so that that animal can walk of their, you know, seemingly of their own volition. We're directing where they're going, but we're letting them work uh, to that uh, end point. What I do a lot of times when I have an animal that is um, not halter trained, and so we get alpacas in that have never really had a halter on during their whole life, and occasionally uh, the llamas, you know, somebody has a rescue llama, you know, we get llamas in that have never seen a halter. Um, or when they have, it's been such an adverse experience, they don't want to see another one. And a lot of times when I put halters on these animals, um, it's not to lead them somewhere, it's to keep them from getting to the highway. And uh, what we do is literally herd them where they're going. And so we will put a halter on and put a long lead on that's you know 10 or 12 feet long, and we'll actually walk behind them. And we're using the pivot point of their shoulder to direct them where we want to go, but we're not pulling them to that point. And so that allows them to have their space or their balance, and so they feel like they're going there in a non-threatening way. So we don't get them ramped up into that antagonistic cycle. And so restraint for procedures, a um, lot of different ways to do that, and what we're talking about mainly is owners interacting with veterinarians, you know, in this context. You know, we're not talking about, you know, necessarily restraining for shearing or restraining for grooming or something like that, but trying to help a veterinarian get uh, accomplished what they need to accomplish. If I go out to an alpaca farm and I'm going to ultrasound 30 or 40 females, we're not going to use a halter. We're probably not going to use any ropes. Uh, we're going to use manual restraint only. We're going to get them into a small area. We're going to capture them and use the neck and tail technique where we wrap one hand around the base of the neck and the other hand around the tail. And our contact with those animals most of the time is going to be less than 30 seconds. You know, if we have an idea of how far pregnant they should be, I'm probably not going to be in contact with them 30 seconds. I may stay there a little bit longer to justify the fee I'm going to charge you, but the um, <laughs> but I get the I get all the information I want to in that first 15 to 30 seconds of contact. And so, um, you know, the issue here is that is that we do um, what's necessary to get the job done, but probably not more than that. Um, when I get when I'm interacting with these animals, I'm a minimalist. We do a lot of stuff on them, but I'm a minimalist, and oftentimes the less we do, you know, the easier it is to accomplish the task. And so I'm not a I'm not a real big one to try to overpower the animals, even though oftentimes that we can, uh, we want to allow them to do uh, what they do best. Uh, we oftentimes use a cush a cushed posture on these animals, and um, it's it's e relatively easy to do with the llamas as much or with the alpacas is much harder to do with the llamas just because of size. But inducing a cushed activity, um, and you can irritate an alpaca and they'll lay down for you, which is easy. But um, what we do to induce a cush, a cush posture is to um, put a halter on their head and pull their head down to the floor and then pick up a leg, a front leg, and they'll usually lay down. And then once they're down, uh, we can maintain that head and neck flat against the ground. We've got them in an unbalanced position, and so they're less likely to want to jump up. Unless we're doing something really aggressive, they'll usually cooperate. Um, there are uh, mech or methods of um, rope restraining the rear legs called chakas where you put a rope on one rear leg, lay it over their back, and tie it to the other rear leg so that if they try to stand, that rope pushes down on their pelvis, and that will you know, maintain them in a cushed position. And we sometimes use that when we know that we're going to need them in a cushed position for you know, a more than a very short period of time. Um, but there are other mechanisms of, of um, keeping them in recumbency and stretch ropes, uh, which are oftentimes used for shearing in alpacas. Many people use stretch ropes or shearing tables where they're actually laid on the side of a table and their legs are stretched out. And these are very effective ways of, of keeping them in lateral recumbency. 
And there are times when uh, we need to do tasks that take more than a short period of time where, where I will lay them down on their side and stretch them out. You know, and uh, that allows us to do what we need to do with minimal risk to the animal. But um, I think the big thing is trying to match that, you know, that manual restraint technique um, with what we're trying to accomplish. Now this is a, a, a manual restraint of the head here, and, and this is a technique that um, Marty Bennett showed us that we do like a lot, and that is the a cradling of the head. And what I see a lot of people do, and I, and I do it myself from time to time as well, is the, the clutch and squeeze. You know, we're going to get that neck and we're going to squeeze it as tight as we can to our body and whatnot. Now you're in a fight, and so the animal's in a defensive posture, and so you're having to overpower the animal uh, to keep it restrained. Uh, by doing this technique where we cradle the mandible in one hand and put the other hand over the back of the head, and so one hand's on the pole, um, we're able to stand away from the animal and keep you know, oftentimes a much superior restraint uh, than clutching them into the body. And I find that it's much easier to get a blood sample that way than it is to have their neck and head clutched into the body. And it's much uh, less intimidating to the animal. Now this is an animal that's got a shoulder luxation, and it's got a sling on his leg, but we're getting ready to change the sling or just finishing one of the two. But, um, you know, that technique allows us to, to uh, allow that animal to maintain its balance. It's in that less threatening posture. It's got its own space. Uh, we're just holding on to the head. And if you have a large enough hand, it also allows you to, um, if the animal gets less cooperative, to grasp the ears. And, uh, and it's okay to squeeze the ears of a camelid. You know, we don't like to do that on a routine basis. Certainly we don't want to induce head shyness. But it's perfectly acceptable to squeeze the ears of a camelid. What we don't want to do is twist them. You know, we're not, not trying to take the ear off. Uh, we're just trying to squeeze it and get their mind off what else we're doing. And so you can see here is, uh, his hand is large enough to where he's able to actually embrace that ear so that if he starts to, starts to jump during the procedure, he can stop it. This animal's actually got a, got a uh, uterine torsion. It's a video that's intended to show her being placed into a lateral position and uh, rope restraints put on her legs and, uh, and extended out. In the alpacas, we find that, the, that we can usually accomplish um, these maneuvers with little to no sedation, um, but we oftentimes will use a little bit of butorphanol. I'll, car I'll talk about chemical restraint in just a minute, so we talk a little bit about some of the drugs that we do use when we need to use them. But um, you know, we try to get things done most of the time without, um, without resorting to drugs. Now, if you're in a situation, uh, you've got a haul in practice or you've got a farm, uh, if you're in a situation to get a camelid shoot, it's a worthwhile investment. And um, I far prefer the types of camelid shoots that have solid sides. Uh, Dr. Farrar showed the shoot that we have here in our reproductive uh, presentations. Certainly, uh, if you want to see it up close and personal, you can come downstairs after the conference. But uh, for veterinary procedures, for the things that we're doing, I like solid-sided shoots. Not that I don't enjoy fixing fractures, but I don't like inducing them. And uh, we have camelids that when we're doing something antagonistic, which veterinarians are prone to do, we're putting in catheters, we're giving injections, we're doing reproductive ultrasound, we're doing something that is antagonistic. Um, the animals uh, may resist restraint quite dramatically sometimes, and if they stick a leg out and get it caught in a bar and break a leg, that's fun for me, but it's not fun for the owner, it's not fun for the animal. And so uh, I like the ones with solid sides, and, I, and particularly the designs that allow us to take those sides off completely. And so we have the useful farm product shoot downstairs, and uh, it's, it's nice and versatile and, and light, so we can move it around, it's easy to use. Um, the one thing that, if you haven't worked around camelid shoots before, but you have worked around cattle before, is the shoulder brace uh, is similar in appearance to a head catch in cattle. Uh, we don't head catch camelids uh, because you can subluxate or luxate their cervical spine, which again is fun for me as a surgeon. It's not fun for the animal or the owner. Um, but it is the, uh, the um, uh, vertical bars that are on those shoots are shoulder braces, not head catches. They are designed to prevent forward motion of the animal while you've got their head tied somewhere. Um, and so what I really prefer is the design of shoots that have an extension beyond the shoulder brace so that we can tie their head forward. Uh, when I see a shoulder brace, 
that doesn't have a head tying extension on it, so they have to tie the head right beside the shoulder brace. We haven't really accomplished a shoulder brace effect. We've turned it into a head catch. You know, if you're tying it right at the shoulder brace, it's essentially a head catch. And so the animals can traumatize their uh, cervical spines fairly easily. And so we, we like the solid-sided designs, like the shoulder braces, but only in the presence of, a, of an extension so that we can tie that head forward. Um, I do like backup bars, um, which are just bars that we put behind them so that you know, they're limited in how far back they can go. Um, I've actually re very rarely used them because the shoots that we happen to have had over the years have not had a place for the backup bars, but um, you know, a lot of people use those. What we tend to do when we want a backup uh, bar is we use a rope and tie it across the chute uh, rather than actually having a bar. Um, most of these chutes come with stand-up straps, and so they come with the slings, and um, I'm not a big fan of using them myself because I tend to find that they interfere with what I need to do um, and I've also find that very frequently those straps um, if you put them on snugly enough to actually embrace the animal most of the time in alpacas it stimulates them to want to lay down and so I usually don't do the stand-up straps but a lot of people use those uh, when we do use them here we usually just put them on the sternum we don't put the belly strap on because the abdominal strap is the one that really seems to upset them to the point to where they want to lay down now, a couple of comments about injection sites um, on these animals. Uh, you've had a little bit of that uh, from different people today, but you know, when we talk about uh, physical restraint, that conversation very frequently leads into injection sites. And the vast majority of what we do is subcutaneous injections or intravenous injections. I do relatively few intramuscular injections in the camelids. And uh, my favorite site for subcutaneous injections is the base of the neck and front of the shoulder because it's the loosest area of tissue that we have easy, easy access to. So it's relatively safe and we can pick that, uh, we can use the hair to pick that skin, skin up to make a tent and then inject underneath that tent. Um, you will see us from time to time use the lateral thoracic wall and so we'll use the loose skin that's right behind the elbow to inject. Um, I would encourage you only to use that area if you're able to restrain the animal well. Um, we have had a few animals come in from perforated thorax, and so the animal jumps while they're doing it, and needle goes through the intercostal space into the lung. Um, that's more often occurs in creas, and so we've had a couple of tension pneumothorax creas come in because of a perforated lung. And so if the animal is really well restrained, and you're confident in your injection techniques, and you're efficient in your injection techniques, it is a space that we use, um, but um, if, if you're doing it by yourself, I would probably go for the loose uh, skin at the base of the neck or in front of the shoulder. Uh, there is a fairly nice area of loose skin around the base of the ear. We, gen we generally try to stay away from that uh, spot because that's where the microchips go and we don't like you know, risking damaging or, or getting an infection around those microchips. Uh, it's also aggravating to the animal. They don't like having things done around their heads, and so we tend to stay away from that spot. Uh, we can inject things into the brisket or the breast animal or breast area of the animal in front of the uh, front leg and medial to it, so up underneath the animal. I, I'm not a big fan of those um, injection sites because if they happen to get abscessed, they can cause some pretty significant problems. Uh, but we have seen owners that. Um, you know, have been routinely doing their ivermectin injections in that location for a long time uh, for a variety of reasons with, uh, you know, with good success. Um, when, we're, when we do use intramuscular routes for injection, usually it's for anesthetic drugs or hormones. Um, pretty much everything else that we do, antibiotics and anti-inflammatories and, and whatnot, uh, vitamin injections, we give subcutaneously. We almost never give intra intramusculars with the exception of anesthetic drugs and hormones. And, and so most of those are, are pretty small volume injections. And so I usually use the triceps muscle of the front limb to inject those products. Uh, but you can also use the semimembranosus and tendinosus muscles in the rear ends. I have uh, talked to people that routinely use the quadriceps muscle in the rear limb, but it really makes me nervous to do that. Uh, because if we get an abscess in that quadriceps muscle, you know, we can end up in some pretty serious situations. Now, creas are a little bit different than adults. 
um, just primarily from a restraint standpoint. You know, you've got this wriggly noodle, you know, that you're trying to control. And, um, and so creas can be a special challenge. Um, what I tend to do is sit on creas. And so when I'm injecting them, I'll get them into a cush position like this, and I'll sit right over top of them. And I can sit down myself, and basically I've got a box there that the crea is in. So I'm not sitting on the crea, I'm sitting over the crea. But, um, you know, that allows me to completely capture that animal. It can't lift me, so it can't stand up, you know, and it's trapped in that area. And I can hook my boots behind it so it can't back up. Back up. And so it gives me absolute control of that animal so that we can do injections without it, you know, um, causing problems during the injection procedure. Creas, um, I really stay away from intramuscular injections in creas if at all possible. I don't give any of my vaccinations intramuscularly. Um, you know, we, in these really young creas, um, we don't want to make them lame, you know, and if we end up inducing a problem, then uh, that's probably going to diminish their milk intake. It may set them up into getting another problem. And we've seen quite a few creas come in that are lame because of intramuscular vitamin D injections. You know, and uh, we give pretty much everything in these guys either subcutaneously or intravenously. Creas are much easier to do intravenous injections in adults. And so we generally uh, reserve um, the muscle for the adults when we're doing those. And so on the adults, you know, we do have those variety of spaces that I referred to. Uh, this is that triangle that's right up in front of the shoulder. So you want to palpate that animal so you know where the spine of the scapula and the shoulder is so that you can go in front of it. And this area right here at the base of the neck, there's a nice fat pad down there, a nice loose bit of tissue that you can lift up. Uh, the area right behind the elbow here is another area that's fairly easy to lift up. It's just a little bit harder to control the animal, so you've got to be careful with that. Triceps muscle, you know, right up there above the elbow. One of the reasons I like the triceps is from a restraint standpoint. You know, if I've got an animal and I'm going to give it a sedative um, and, I'm, and I want to put it in the triceps, I can uh, get up against the side of the animal, lean over to the other side, and inject the triceps muscle on the other side. So if they try to avoid the needle, they're coming into me. If they're trying to avoid me, they're going into the needle, which is what I want anyway. And, um, and so that's a, a nice technique. When I'm here in the back, and we're going to inject these semimembranosa, semitendinosus muscles, um, you know, we've got we to gotta make sure that the animal's not kicking and, um, and really flailing in the rear end while we're doing it so we can inject accurately. What I usually do when I'm doing an injection back here is I go to about a hand's breadth below the ischium so that we get into that muscle belly, but we're not too far down on the leg. And then I'll grab the base of the tail and elevate the tail a little bit. And Marty Bennett um, talked to us about doing those circular motions with the tail. If you don't believe in that sort of thing, grab the base of a tail of a, of a camella that's really anxious and just sit there and rotate it. Don't spin it, you know, but just rotate that tail. And you will feel their muscles relax. You will feel them go into a state of relaxation. And so a lot of times if we've got one, we're trying to do an ultrasound or something, and they're starting to really battle us, uh, we start that rotation technique, and that does calm them down quite a bit. I'll tell you, the other one that, that is a relaxation technique, um, I mean, I'm not real big into aromas and all that kind of stuff. To me, or, to me aromas is silage, manure. Um, <laughs> but there are some things that you can see the calming effect on them. And the other one is a philtrum, is a rub their dental pad, so the, the dorsal aspect, the upper uh, arcade there where there's no teeth. Uh, between the split lips and you just take your finger in there and so while you've got that that head hold my hands are big enough that I can slide a finger up and just wrote and just rub on that dental pad and you will feel their neck relax you know and it sounds kind of foofy but try it I think you'd be surprised at what you see now uh, intravenous access I'll make a couple of comments about that uh, most of what we do, this is a properly color patterned alpaca, so we're, we're all breeding for this, uh, for this color. Um, most of what we do, we use the jugular vein. You know, part of that is because of restraint. Part of it's because of the size of the vein. Part of it's because all the other livestock we work with, we use the jugular vein. And so we just are jugular people. And, uh, you know, but... Uh, it's really easy to get a cephalic catheter in a crea. 
you know, and I find a lot of times in the creas when we put jugular catheters in, it's really easy to get hematomas. You put a wrap on their neck and now they don't want to swallow or they don't want to go nurse or they, you know, spend all this time laying down stretching out their neck because it's uncomfortable. It's like putting a, a tie on a five-year-old to go to church, you know. They don't, they don't hear anything the minister's saying because they're spending the whole time worried about this tie and when they can get it off. And so I, uh, I am an advocate of uh, cephalic uh, venous catheters in creas because they're very easy to do. If you can catheterize a cat, you can sure as heck catheterize an alpaca. Adults are more challenging. You know, adults are more challenging, but you can certainly do it. Um, we occasionally will use a saphenous vein. You know, we've occasionally had these really sick animals that have, uh, they're on their fourth or fifth or sixth catheter. And so we're searching for other veins to put them in. So we do, we do use the saphenous vein. The ear vein um, is a convenient access for an animal that's anesthetized. It's not as easy to do on the awake animals. We use auriculars more commonly in cattle. And then the lateral thoracic, again, is a harder vein to get, but you know it is one that we can put a catheter in once in a while. And so the, um, you know, I'd encourage you to think about other, other sites, particularly in young creas, because some of those um, you know, are still pretty easy to do. So the jugular catheter. Now, fortunately for me, I'd been working on camelids for four or five years before I read that you can't put a catheter in the middle of the neck um, in camelids. And so fortunately, I'd done enough of them to know that the person that wrote that was full of it, as most of us are. Um, the big thing for uh, IV access is to find, find the technique that works for you and do it again and again and again and again. You know, and that's, a, that's the thing I try to tell veterinarians is that, um, you know, you play to your strength. And uh, in, the, in the original literature with these guys, uh, they said that you had to do it right up here at the angle of the jaw, that that was the only place, you know, you could get a catheter in. And then there were other people that said that venipuncture could only do it down here at the thoracic inlet, <clears throat> and that was the only place you could do it in. It's certainly true that in adults, and as a practice tip, in adult males, it's far easier to do venipunctures and catheters up there by the angle of the jaw. Males have a pretty thick fighting plate on their neck, and it is more challenging to get a mid-cervical uh, catheter in their neck in males. And so in, a, in an adult breeding male, oftentimes I will go up here along that angle of the jaw. Uh, but for typical purposes, I'm going to go somewhere in the central central third of the neck. And um, the structures that, that we're palpating, Dr. Blow uh, mentioned earlier that, you know, you don't see that nice rise and fall of the jugular in the adult, you know, and so if you're, if you're waiting to see the jugular, you're going to be there a while. Um, what I typically do if I want to try to see it or show it um, is I don't watch it fill, I watch it fall. Uh, these are long-necked animals, and uh, takes a while for that jugular vein to fill up. And so what I usually tell people is if you're going to bleed them is to hold off the vein, count to 30, and then put in your needle. You know, if you hold off and put your needle in, the vein is still pretty small. It takes a little bit of time for that to enlarge. And so if you really want to see the vein, I hold them off at the base of the neck, wait 30 seconds to a minute, and then let go. And you'll see that hair fall because it'll collapse quite quickly. But it is hard to see it rise. But it is very easy to feel the trachea. And almost all animals, those males sometimes it's more challenging, but you can almost always feel the trachea. And so I've just taken a magic marker and, and lined out the trachea rings that we were feeling there. And it's pretty easy, except in the really obese or really heavily muscled males, uh, to feel their transverse processes, the bony projections uh, ventral to their vertebral bodies, and the jugular veins in the middle, fortunately. And so the most common mistake I see when people are trying to do venipuncture and they can't get blood is they're going too far laterally. They're thinking about horses and cattle, and so they're out here, and there's a bone between them and the jugular vein. They're not going to get blood out of that. You know? And so getting in there and, and knowing where the transverse processes are and the trachea is and going in the middle. I encourage people when they're novice uh, blood collectors to use the right side. There's two reasons for that. Is one is the right jugular vein is smaller, and so if you can get the right jugular vein, you can sure as heck get the left. But the other thing is that the um, esophagus is on the left side, and if you're too aggressive, you know, and when you're doing that first time, it's 
you know, you're probing around trying to find that vein sometimes. If you're too aggressive and you hit the carotid artery, you'll induce a hematoma. And there are reports in the literature of animals getting esophageal obstruction from carotid hematomas from venipuncture. The other thing is, if you've irritated enough, the animal enough in the process of getting them restrained and holding off this vein and sticking a needle in their throat, their esophagus actually might be full of saliva. And so you might be getting salivary contamination of your sample or an abscess in the neck as a result of puncturing into that uh, rumen fluid. And so, you know, there's a number of things there, I think, it's, it's patience. The reason I've got three or four of these transverse processes uh, drawn on there is because I never bleed at my thumb. You know, we hold off to get that vein to rise, but I put the needle in a hand's breadth away from my thumb because the vein tapers down where you've got it held off. And so why would I want to vein puncture it at the taper? I want to get it at a full vein. And so there's no real reason to put the needle over your thumb, come up the neck a little ways, and put it in. And then the, the last practice tip I'll tell you about um, intravenous vena puncture um, is if you've got, I wear a seven and a half surgical, I wear eights here because we've changed companies, but seven and a half to an eight surgical glove. Um, my hand is large enough on all alpacas and many llamas to where I can hold the jugular vein off and grab the nuchal ligament at the same time. These guys are the definition of pencil neck. And so the nuchal ligament is that tight ligament that runs from the pole of their head down to their withers that keeps their head from dropping off, you know. And um, if you can control the nuchal ligament, you can control the animal. It's the Vulcan grip of the camelid, right? And um, the, if you ever, you ever heard of the death grip? No, I'm talking about the camelid death grip. The <laughs> we can discuss Vulcan death grips later. Um, the, uh, the camella death grip is uh, a, ma a male fighting tool. And if you look at the fighting teeth, untrimmed fighting teeth of males, they have that caudal angle to them. And so they're designed to bite and shred. They're not, they're, not, uh, they're not intended to bite and release and bite and release and bite and release like a dog. They're intended to bite and shred like a great white shark. All right? And so when they sink in, they tear through. So if one male wants to eliminate a competitive male from the breeding group, they grab their neck and shred out their carotid artery in their trachea. Or they grab the back of their neck and they shred out the nuchal ligament. So now they can't raise their head, so they starve to death or, or dehydrate to death because they can't raise their head. And so that nuchal ligament is a powerful tool for me to compress down and it keeps their body under control. And they'll respect that a lot. They'll respect that a lot. All right. And so this is just jugular catheterization. We, we normally, um, looks like I got those in backwards order. We normally um, use a three to a five and a quarter inch uh, catheter. Um, I won't use anything under about three inches in an adult and anything under two inches in a baby. Um, the little, the really short catheters, about the only thing I'll put those in are the ear veins and the ear arteries. They come out too easily. You know, even in an animal like this, it doesn't have a lot of loose skin on their neck. They just come out way too easily. And so we'll make a stab incision in the skin, you know, with either a scalpel blade or an introducer needle um, to allow us to slide this catheter into, the, into that jugular vein. You see how far away I am from my hand? That's what I'm talking about, you know. That vein is at maximum distension up here. Down here, it's tapered. All right. And then we'll, you know, we'll hook an extension set on it and, and usually tape it, in, tape it onto their neck. OK, now, occasionally we need to practice pharmacology in the field, better living through chemistry. Some animals need some uh, pharmaceutical encouragement for cooperation. You know, and there are procedures that we do that we know that are going to be painful that we want to use drugs to ameliorate pain. Castrations, you know, minor surgical procedures in the field, things like that. Um, we're going to use some type of chemical restraint. The big things to remember are that um, there are untoward effects of sedation and anesthesia, and we want to prevent that. 
And so chemical restraint is not something to be afraid of because it can increase the safety of the procedure. Safety for the owner, safety for the vet, safety for the animal. It can increase the efficiency of the procedure. It can take an hour and a half ordeal and make it a 20 minute procedure. And so it is something, it's not something to be afraid of, but it can induce bloat by suppressing intestinal motility. It can cause regurgitation if they're really heavily sedated, so they lose control of their esophageal sphincters. Um, you know, it can cause obstruction of the airway, either from spasm of the retinoids or from obstruction from fluids. It can cause cardiovascular and pulmonary depression, and so decreased respirations, decrease or hypotension, decreased blood pressure, and whatnot. And so there are side effects that we do need to worry about. Fortunately, camelids are pretty tolerant of most of the drugs that we use, especially if you're used to working around cattle, sheep, or goats. They're very tolerant of most of the sedative drugs that we use, and so most of the things that uh, we need to accomplish, we can accomplish with simply xylazine or butorphanol or something like that. And so the camelids on a dosage standpoint are somewhere between horses and cattle. You know, we know that they're much more tolerant of these drugs than cattle are, but probably not quite so much as horses. And so the doses that we give are, are if you're a horse person, they're, they look meek. If you're a ruminant person, they look aggressive. But uh, you shouldn't be afraid of using them. The dose that we use does vary depending on the route that we're giving it. And so we're going to give relatively more drug if we're using it intramuscularly than if we're using it intravenously. Uh, we do see differences between the species, and so alpacas are far more tolerant of drugs than llamas are. I very frequently will give an adult Hakaya alpaca the same dosage that I would give an adult llama. You know, and so their alpacas are much more resistant to those drugs, and we do see a breed effect. Hakayas are more sensitive to drugs than Surrey's. You know, I sort of think of Surrey's as the Arabians of the camelids because they chew up drugs. They're hot-blooded animals, so to speak. And so it takes relatively more anesthetic drugs to uh, control a Surrey as compared to, compared to Akaya. And we'll get into how we step up those ratios a little bit in a minute, but um, there are differences between them. Xylazine, I would encourage you to use most of these drugs intramuscularly if you're using them because it's safer uh, for the animal. But intramuscular route of administration is less predictable. And so if you're very comfortable with your venipuncture techniques, you're going to get a much more consistent, much more reliable response by intravenous administration. Um, but for much of what we're doing, you know, we can get what we need to do in intramuscularly and not risk an intracarotid injection or not, or not risk a perivascular injection where we end up with not enough drug on board to get the procedure done. So the doses that we usually use for alpacas and llamas for xylazine, uh, you'll notice that the alpacas are about a tenth higher than the uh, llamas. And so if we're doing alpacas intravenously, 0.2 to 0.4, IM 0.3 to 0.5 makes per kg. Pretty consistently gives us heavy sedation. Uh, with Surrey's, we'll use this upper end, and so Akaya's would be more 0 0.2, 0 0.3, Zuri's 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Llamas, we're going to cut that down a tenth. Um, you know, llamas, it just doesn't take as much drug to get the same procedure done. And those, you should have those dosages in the, in the notes, but that's generally what, what we use. If you're sedating them enough to lay them down, which we very frequently are when we're using xylazine. Um, we're going, usually, we're going to lay their head over something that will tilt the nose down. And the reason for that being is if they're accumulating saliva, which they very frequently do, it'll run out the mouth instead of sitting around the pharynx because it'll obstruct breathing. If they happen to start erupting a little bit during the procedure, so they're trying to bring up uh, rumen gas. Uh, that stuff will drain out the nose instead of accumulating around the airway. And so we want to have that head tilted down a little bit. And then we expect to get about 20 minutes um, out of an intravenous injection. Uh, we probably would get about double that from an intramuscular injection. You know, and so the intramuscular injection is 
a little bit less predictable and lasts longer than the intravenous, um, but it certainly is safer from you know, an administration standpoint. And so they're very useful for short procedures and whatnot. Occasionally we need to uh, reverse xylosine. Yep. Yes, when we're laying them down on their side, and they're going to stay on that side through a procedure, we'd much rather have them down on their right-hand side. Their, their fermentation vat, the equivalent of the rumen, is on the left side, and we would like that gas cap to be able to bulge up. And the reason for that is, is that when the gas cap is up, the fluid or liquor compartment is the uh, lower esophageal sphincter is underneath that fluid. And the, and the nociceptors around the esophageal sphincter, if it's underwater, tell it to stay tightly shut. If it's in gas, it tells it it's okay to open. And if they're on the right side and that gas cap is surrounding the lower esophageal sphincter, they can eructate during the procedure, which is bad. And so we'd rather have them on the right. Plus, it allows the rumen to distend out away from their abdomen instead of distending into the abdomen, you know, which can, their right side. Yeah, you want to want them laying on their right side. Yeah, also the correct side. So right, right. Yep. Okay. Uh, occasionally we need to reverse xylazine. There are a number of different drugs that we use for this. Um, it's worth mentioning that you need to be cautious about the use of telazoline to reverse xylazine in the camelids. And we really are cautious about that in all of the ruminants but we're particularly cautious about it in the camelids. There have been multiple cases where telazoline has been injected rapidly intravenously to reverse xylazine and the heart stops. And uh, telazoline given by a rapid bolus, which it specifically says on the label not to do, but when the animal's dying, we don't read labels, do we? We just draw it up in a syringe. And so you give it by a rapid IV bolus and it induces sinus arrest, and so their heart stops. Most of the time it'll start again, but that's a long, that's a long most of the time, yeah. And so the uh, dosages for those, uh, the yohimbine is about a tenth of a mg per kg, uh, the telazoline is about a mg per kg. We tend to stay on the lower end of these doses most of the time. Um, I don't really use adapamazole much, I don't know if anybody in the audience does, but um, we did a research project where we were looking at metatomidine and we're using adapamazole and we, we really weren't very happy with it and so I've never kind of never gone back to it. Um, some people will use dopram which is a respiratory stimulant. It's not a specific reversal agent for xylazine but one of the things that we see with xylazine is respiratory depression and dopram will stimulate them out of that. And so we usually start with a relatively low dose and then work our way up when we need to reverse them. But if we prepare those animals well, you know, hopefully we don't get into this situation very often. You know, we probably don't reverse more than two or three a year, really. You know, so it's not something I'd expect to have to be doing routinely. Yeah, the yohimbine will wear off quicker, and so they often get re-sedated re after the yohimbine wears off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't leave the farm just yet. That's right. Um, now, one of the things that we developed uh, over the last five years is a uh, five or six years is a ketamine stun, and uh, we call it a stun because it's not an anesthetic protocol. We're not putting them under general anesthesia. Um, this is a sedation protocol, and so the dosages here are not general anesthetic dosages. I think the dosages in your notes are general anesthetic dosages. These are about one tenth to 1 20th what we would use for anesthesia. And so uh, what we do here is, is on top of that xylazine, we'll add a narcotic, butorphanol, and a neuroleptic uh, ketamine to it, but at very low dosages. So the animal stays fully conscious through the entire procedure. It just provides a much more profound sedation for them. And, uh, and the ketamine actually is a dissociative. And in, we developed this protocol for cattle and have adapted it to the camelids. Um, and the reason we developed it in cattle is because a lot of times we're trying to do procedures on very aggressive cattle, and the dosages are different for cattle, but 
the ketamine is there at really low dosages to put them in their happy place. And so it's a dissociative drug. And so it takes their mind and sort of lets it float out in those grassy fields in California while we're doing what we need to do. Um, I suppose the camelid mine is floating in the Andes or something. But it's a, it puts them out in a different plane of existence than we are. So we can do procedures without them really seemingly being aware of it. And so it's, it is a fully conscious procedure. I will show you general anesthetic dosages of this combination, but you know, realize that, that this is a fully conscious procedure, so it's very safe to do in field settings. If we gave that IV, we'd expect to get about 20 minutes out of it. If we give it IM or sub-Q, we expect to get the better part of an hour out of it. And so depending on what we're doing, you know, we may um, want, to, want to ramp the xylazine up a bit by using this cat stun. Now, we do induce general anesthesia periodically, and most of the time when we do general anesthesia is for castrations or something like that. We're going to do a surgical procedure, but one that's very uh, amenable to doing in farm settings. If we're going to completely anesthetize the animal, we've got to make sure that the animal is prepared for the general anesthetic because this is going to be a much more intense procedure and we don't want them bloating and, and eructating and, and getting aspiration pneumonia and all those sorts of things. And so we've got to make sure that we can put the head in a more aggressive downward position than we do just with the sedation. And so we're going to tilt that head more aggressively and um, we've got to have that animal prepared by holding it off feed, which I'll talk more about in a minute, so that we have a lower risk of bloat and regurgitation. And then ultimately, we need to consider whether we should be prepared for endotracheal intubation. Because if we get that animal too deep, too fast, and its airway becomes compromised, there's no time to drive back to the clinic and get a tube and bring it out. And so we need to probably have a kit available that we could intubate them if we needed to. And so we tend to put these guys in a fairly aggressive head down posture. Um, this is one that's on a, a foam pad, but you can use straw bales and things like that uh, to establish that head down posture. Basically what we're doing is we're keeping saliva draining away from the larynx, and we're also keeping any fluids that may get erupted draining away from the, from the larynx. As long as they're not in that position too terribly long, you know, it's pretty safe to do that and, and gives them a better airway protection. I'll show you a technique for endotracheal intubation. We get calls about this as, you know, how do you put a trach tube in a camelid? Uh, they are challenging because they have, you know, that long mouth that you can't open very wide. You know, they're not a dog. And so what we do is we have an extra long laryngoscope blade. And so this is, a, this is the longest normal blade you get these extended blades out, and that's, you know, 20 plus centimeters long. And that way we can feed that all the way back into the back of the mouth so that we can see that larynx very easily. And then we have these long tubes, and so this is a full tracheal tube, and so it's designed for the horse, and so it is extreme, it's quite long. And then we have this long catheter that we can place through the center of that tube so we can make it rigid because this hole is pretty far back in their mouth. Uh, so we need to be able to see, with that extra long blade of the laryngoscope, we need to have a long tube so that we can reach the trachea. We need to have a long stylet so we can keep that tube rigid while we're putting it in the trachea. And then we need to have something to tie the tube to the, to the jaw. And so once we get that tube placed, we're going to tie it off in place. And so this is an alpaca that's uh, been anesthetized. She's sitting in sternal recumbency. We've got her, got her propped up against the bale there. Uh, we're going to extend this head and neck up so that the, um, so that the nose and the neck are in a straight line. And so we're going to hyperextend that head to try to open up that airway as much as we can. And then this is that long laryngoscope blade here looking all the way down. And what we do with that blade is we get it in the back of the mouth and we push the soft palate up so that it exposes the larynx. And then we'll uh, deflect the epiglottis down so that we can see the arytenoids. And so these are the arytenoid cartilages in here we're looking straight into the trachea. And so by doing that, we have an open path right into the trachea, and so it's relatively easy to pass that tube. And so you can see how long these things are, you know, relative to people. So that's a long tube going down this stylet. We're going to feed that right into the trachea. Once that tube gets into the trachea, we'll pull the stylet out. 
and tie it to the mandible so that it's secured. And so if we feel like we're going to do something that really demands protecting the airway, this is how we do it. You know, nothing in there is particularly expensive. It's just specialized equipment, and so something that you'd have to consciously go get. Other things that we think about when we're doing a general anesthesia is how long the procedure is going to be. Are we going to do an intravenous or an intramuscular technique? Um, and realizing that when we do that intramuscularly, as with the sedation, that the uh, efficacy of those drugs varies from patient to patient. And so uh, we tend to use the butorphanol, xylazine, ketamine combination at anesthetic dosages because that has proven the most reliable for us. And so, you know, we want to be careful about those dosages and we want to maintain patient safety. And so the, the, co the cocktail that I use almost to exclusion, you know, it's very rare for me to use something else um, in, when I'm doing a field anesthesia is butorphanol, xylazine, and ketamine. And um, you'll, you'll hear people call this uh, BKX, but I like to think of it as BXK because it's increasing dosages. Um, and so when I tell you the dosage is just BXK, you'll hear people call it BKX. Um, the butorphanol xylazine ketamine, it does have some variability in the consistency of effect. I think a lot of that has to do, if you're giving it intramuscularly, do you get all of it in the muscle? Um, and some of it certainly has to do with patient attitude. These guys should be held off feed a minimum of 12 hours, overnight. You know, if we know we're gonna, we know we're gonna castrate tomorrow, we pull them in, we take them off food. Um, when, we, when we say to hold an animal off food, it means all feed material. You know, a lot of times when we tell owners to hold them off feed, then they don't give them grain, but they've got all the hay and grass they want. Um, when we hold them off feed, we want them held off all food materials because the grass and the hay contribute to bloat and fermentation and digestion just as much as anything else. The grain produces more gas and acid but all the other processes are still there, and so all feed. Uh, we want to have a quiet environment. The last thing we want to do is be chasing this animal around the pasture for 30 minutes before we're going to give them an anesthetic. And so, you know, they need to be caught up in, in a quiet environment so that those drugs will be more consistent and reliable. And then we need to have sufficient help. You know, the worst thing to do is try to do something by yourself and you really don't have enough hands. So the BXK cocktail that we make um, for field use is we take a one gram bottle of ketamine and we add one ml of, of the large animal xylazine. So we add 100 milligrams of xylazine into that bottle. And then we add one ml of the 10 milligrams of butorphanol into that bottle. And so that cocktail right there allows us to dose uh, based on an approximation of body weight we need to have a pretty good, pretty good idea of what they weigh. You know, it's very common. One of the games we like to play with our students is you get an alpaca out that's a nice big acai. It's got a full, years of, full year of hair growth on it. You say, how much does that animal weigh? 240 pounds. You know, it was about 120 pounds of something under that fiber. And we don't dose for fiber. We dose for muscle. And so the... Um, uh, having a pretty pretty good idea of what those animals weigh is important, whether you're using a weigh scale or a weigh tape or whatever. Um, that cocktail allows us to dose alpacas at about a mil per 40 pounds and llamas at about a mil per 50 pounds. We will increase the amount of drug for males, uh, half a mil for alpacas and one mil for llamas. Uh, we will also increase for surreys. And so if it's a female surrey, we'll add a half a mil on it because she's a surrey. You know, on those things. And that gives us a very consistent uh, surgical type anesthesia for about a half an hour. We expect those animals after an intramuscular injection to lay down. So that dosage and whatnot is intramuscular. We expect them to lay down in three to eight minutes. And so it's pretty quick and uh, in onset. And so if you wanted to actually dissect that dosing regime out, um, you know, you can set that on a milligram per kilogram basis so that you don't have to mix up a whole bottle of it. But um, the BXK cocktail bottles, if we keep that in a cool, dark environment, we've kept that around for uh, easily a month at a time, oftentimes longer than that, and still had pretty good efficacy for it. So all of those products are, 
are types of acids, and so they, they don't neutralize each other very quickly. And so if we mix up a, BK, a bottle of BKX, we usually can keep that on the shelf for quite a while. You know. Now, if you need something longer than 45 minutes, uh, then we've got to start rethinking things. It's pretty safe to lay them down under this cocktail in the, feed for, in the field for up to about 45 minutes. If we're going to go longer than that, then we need to make other arrangements. We're going to haul them into the clinic and put them on a gas anesthetic. There are some continuous infusion things that we can do intravenously, like triple drips and double drips. But you get into bigger issues with oxygenation and, and uh, whatnot. And so if we're going to do something that we can't accomplish in 45 minutes, then we're going to bring them into the clinic and probably put them on gas uh, with that endotracheal tube. Yeah. Well, the uh, halothane we don't really keep around anymore. You know, and so we don't really have access to it. Isofluorane, um, I really like isofluorane because it's rapid onset, rapid, relatively rapid offset, and it's very safe. Um, I'm not a big fan of sevofluorane, and the, thing, the reason I don't like sevofluorane is it's more expensive, you know, as part of it. The reason I don't like sevofluorane is that it blows off so fast that they wake up too quick. And um, I see animals thrash sometimes when they're coming out of sevo. And so I like the isofluorine because they get over it quickly, but gradually. It's not like a light switch. That sevofluorine sometimes is like a light switch. And we've had animals careen off of walls because they just leap to their feet. And then they don't have the senses to be able to stabilize themselves, and so they ram into a wall. And so, I, so for me, isofluorine is almost exclusively what I use. Yes. Yeah, the question, the question is, is uh, sites for injectable dewormers, and so mainly the avermectins, uh, they're only labeled for subcutaneous administration. Um, I've never given them any other route other than subcutaneous administration. Yeah. Yeah, I've, ne I've never given a, an avermectin intramuscular. I've always given them sub-Q, yeah. Yeah, most of the, uh, the question is about output on the gas machines. You know, most of these use a five liter bag, and so the large dog bag, and so a three liter to a five liter bag, and so it's really, most of the small animal machines can handle these guys quite easily. Yeah. 